Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this afternoon's presentation. Um, I know a number of you have brought things with you from your earlier activities. If you could put that on the floor, any pens, paper, writing utensils, and sunglasses. If you have sunglasses, please take those off. So we're giving our full attention. And without further ado, Pablo will now start the presentation. Okay, so with the ongoing presentations on diversity and in connection with this month being Women's History Month, we'll be listening to leaders that have served our community in a great way. Each leader, leader will be introduced by a member of student council. We will be holding a Q&A after all of the presentations. Thank you so much. Now um, we have Miss Becky Bayless, and she started her career in the oil and gas business in Dallas, Texas after graduating from Arkansas State University with a BS degree in accounting. She be began working in accounting, in, in accounting and became very interested in the complexities of oil and gas accounting in particular. She worked her way to manager positions within accounting and then moved to controller pos positions at a handful of different oil and gas companies within Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, which led her to her current role as, as Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Indigo Minerals, LLC. Indigo has over $1 billion worth of oil and gas assets assets, which consist of acreage <laughs> and natural gas and oil wells her company's drills on their 650,000 acres of land. Becky is a founding partner of the company and is in charge of, account of accounting and finance along with the strategic planning of the com company's acquisitions and diverse <laughs> She is two children here at Cooper, Addison in fifth grade and McKenna in sixth grade. She is a trustee on the board at the John Cooper School and also holds a position on the finance committee for the board at a local country club in the Woodlands Carlton Woods. Now please welcome Mrs. Becky Bayless. Thank you, that was very sweet, I appreciate that. Well good afternoon. I see some familiar faces out there. It's great to see all of you today and have the opportunity to speak. I'm going to tell my story today about how I broke through this glass ceiling. First things first though, raise your hand if you know what the glass ceiling is. Does anybody here have an idea of what that is? Okay, that's a few of you, that's a good start. Well, hopefully you'll know a little better after today. It's really just an analogy to explain a restriction that's something that's not obvious that's there, but it is there, and it can be seen or unseen that keeps you from reaching a goal or an opportunity. Today I'm going to talk about the glass ceiling that historically has existed for females that embark on a career primarily dominated by males. Not necessarily for any good reason, but just because it's always been that way. I made a career choice early in my life to be an accountant. I know, I know that doesn't make me sound very exciting, but it was extremely interesting to me. Why? Because I love numbers. I love math. I, as a young person, math and math puzzles were the fa my favorite thing to do. And I knew what I wanted to do with my career by 11th grade. And that was right after taking my first accounting class. But being simply an accountant is not a male-dominated field. But it was my ambition to take accounting and finance knowledge that I gained in college and with my jobs outside of college to become the top of my field, the top executive in my field. And today, as she mentioned, I'm the executive vice president and chief financial officer of a multi-billion dollar oil and gas company. But on that journey, I did encounter the glass ceiling. To kind of frame this for you, there are less than 10% of the energy companies, CFO positions that are held by women. So I don't have a very big peer group. I grew up in a big family. I had five brothers and sisters and lots of cousins. And being the youngest of that group, they all like to tell me how and when to do everything in my life. So it was my goal when I grew up to make sure that I didn't have to listen to them forever. 
This required that I gain some freedom, which made my career very important to me at that point in my life. So today I'm going to focus on three points that I believe will help begin to define your views on a potential career path, but mainly on a historically male-dominated field, that you're not going to shy away from it. The first two points are important whether you're male or female. But admittedly, I'm going to tend to focus many of my comments today on the benefits these have for the females. And boys, you will get the benefit of this perspective. And hopefully, this will influence you to make positive use of your new understanding of the issues of this glass ceiling. So there's a little something for everybody today. So number one, know yourselves. Ask yourselves the question, what do I want to do when I grow up? What motivates me? What stimulates me in a way that makes me wake up every day and want to attack that day with everything I have? Today those answers might be your favorite sport or hanging out with your friends or getting what you're going to eat for lunch that day, possibly. But as you grow up and you get closer to choosing your college, you will begin to think of your career choices. You will know yourself better at that stage in your life, and a more meaningful answer to those questions will start to form. But let me try to get the wheels turning in your head today. You need to explore yourself and to look for your individual interests and capabilities. And said another way, what are you good at? What stimulates some kind of desire in you? For me, as I mentioned earlier, my desire was independence for my crazy family. In particular, financial independence. I came from a small, lower, middle class family, and money was really tight at all times, so it became very important to me. I knew I was comfortable working with numbers, so then I focused on a career that best fit my capability and to help me reach my goal of financial independence. And then I never gave up. So important things you should consider when exploring your options for your career is what is, what is your uh, best trait academically? What are your best technological skills? What is your comfort level in your social skills? Are you a talker? Are you a listener? Do you like group projects? Are you more comfortable working alone and staying quietly focused? Just know that knowing yourself is an important first step to thoughtfully choosing your career. But remember to be true to yourself as you consider your future career. Because each of us has a gift to offer this world, and we have a responsibility to use those gifts wisely. But the real beauty of that concept is that we each have different gifts. So number two has two parts. One, visualize it happening to you, and then two, work hard to achieve it. But let's start with visualization. Does anybody want to give a definition of visualization? No, no one? Visualization is a process of just interpreting in visual terms or forming a mental picture of something in your head. Somewhat confusing, but let me give you an example. Another easy question for you. Who in here knows who Jim Carrey is? Raise your hand. You know the Grinch? Everybody knows him. Jim Carrey is an actor that's been very successful, and he has a great example of the power of visualization. He spent many years struggling to become a successful actor, and during this point of his career, he decided to visualize being financially successful, which was the most important thing to him at that time in his career. To do this, he took out his checkbook and he wrote himself a $10 million check, and he carried that check in his billfold with him for several years, looking at that check every day as he was striving to reach his goal to make a actual, an actual $10 million. The amazing part of the story is this caused him to continuously believe in his ability to make that $10 million happen, and it did. When he signed a contract for his biggest role at that time, his offer was for $10 million. It was the role he played in Dumb and Dumber. Anybody heard of that movie? You think it was worth $10 million? Yeah. So, yeah, good. Well, in essence, Jim Carrey willed that to happen by constantly visualizing his success and then constantly working hard to achieve it. So let's talk about that part for just a second. 
I think there's probably three main things that I focus on in the achievement of your success. One being work ethic, second being professionalism, and third is you have to have a good sense of humor. First of all, work ethic. It's a moral benefit and importance of work. Everybody hates that word work, right? But it has its ability to strengthen your character, which is something you need to value in your life. I'm going to tell you a story about how my work ethic was formed when I first started in, a, in the real world of work. My first job out of college was at a company that manufactured eyeglasses in Arkansas. But I, was, I graduated with my accounting degree. I got my first job in accounting. I was actually very proud of myself. I was meeting all my goals and the perfect timeline that I had structured for myself. I worked in a group of about 15 accountants. But I didn't have a great rapport with my boss at the time. And I often called home to tell my dad about this. One day my boss called me in and asked me to follow him to the coffee room. The coffee room is a place that in corporate America is one of the messiest rooms that exists because that's a place that everyone goes to print, print things to the printer, copy their papers, but the mess they leave behind is really not something they really consider especially back then. He pointed to a huge mess of hole-punched papers that are the little dots of paper after you punch holes in it, and they were scattered all over the floor. And he said, I want you to pick those up and clean up this area. I was devastated. Here I am, an accountant with a degree, and I was pretty proud of myself. And I thought to myself, I am not the janitor. But I was in complete shock and a little humiliated, but I proceeded to get work, get to work cleaning up that mess. But when I got home that night, I called my dad and said, Dad, you're not going to believe this. My boss made me pick up whole punch papers off of the floor and clean up the coffee room, and it wasn't even my mess. And my dad's response was, yes, I can believe that. If your boss asks you to do something, you do it. What is wrong with him asking you to do anything, and especially pick those up? He said, in fact, you need to take this on as your responsibility to pick up those every day and keep that room clean and never be asked to do that again. I was mortified. But I followed my dad's advice. And each day I picked up the whole punch papers that everybody left on the floor, and I kept the room clean without ever being asked to do it again. About two months later, which seemed like two years later, my boss called me into his office and said that he noticed that I had taken on that responsibility and it showed him that I had a very strong work ethic. And he appreciated seeing that in me. And that day he promoted me to supervisor of those 15 accountants that I worked with. That gave me the opportunity to learn leadership skills very early in life that really are a huge stepping stone to being in the position I'm in today. The second important thing that I mentioned earlier, does anyone remember what it was after my tremendously impressive story of whole punch papers? <laughs> Professionalism. The CEO of our company has a saying for this that I just love. And we'll be walking to corporate meetings, whether that's in New York or here in Houston or in Dallas, and he'll be walking in, and we're power walking. He'll go, everybody, let's keep it up here. Let's keep it up here. And I used to not understand what he meant by that, but i got to tell you, I love that saying because it, he's really telling us, keep it above the norm. Keep above everyone else in everything you do. One of his main things is appearance. In the corporate world, your first impression is so important to people. Dress for success. Succeeding in a typical male role doesn't mean you need to look or act like a man, but your place of work is not the place to show off a new outfit or your new hairdo. You actually want to stand out for your contribution and for your experience that adds value to the company that you work for. This should extend to your actions as well. You should always be considerate of others and be supportive of their contributions in the same way that you would want them to be supportive of yours. Always refrain from talking negatively about others in the workplace. Really, that goes across life, doesn't it? Everywhere. So third, to help achieve your success, 
is a good sense of humor. Don't ever take yourselves too seriously, especially at work. Finding your balance of expressing who you are in a way that keeps your peers and colleagues at ease is an art. It is one of the hardest things to achieve as a female and a, that a man really never has to consider in the workplace. Being surrounded by a majority of other men, he has the luxury of already fitting in. But the woman has to work to fit in. I have found that I have to have a very good sense of humor and be able to laugh at myself with others. It's an, that's actually an extremely effective way when trying to put someone else at ease around me. So the third point of all the points on how to be define your views of pursuing your potential career, you've got to be your own best advocate. Always advocate your gender as well. This will help overcome the hurdles that change these statistics. Okay, girls, now I'm talking mainly to you. If you do choose to embark on a career that is not a typical role for a female, then please remember that women do face harder choices between professional success and personal fulfillment. Girls, it is typical and natural that we take on the more nurturing role with our families for both our spouses and our children. If you choose to get married and to have children and to have a job outside or a career outside of your home, just remember that it's all possible and it's extremely rewarding. So in the workplace for you girls, stay visible by promoting yourself. And remember that this good sense of humor comes in play here. Don't take yourself too seriously or you'll become less approachable and less liked by your colleagues. Always present yourself in a way that makes others want to engage with you because they know you'll be there to help them along the way. Have a seat at the table, and I'm talking about the boardroom table here. Take your position within a company with conviction. Don't take the chair that's over to the side by the window. Sit at the table, you're worthy of that. This conviction comes from being prepared and knowing your job better than anybody else there knows it. Women traditionally underestimate their abilities. Their tendency is to self-doubt more than a man. And admittedly, sometimes a confident woman is viewed negatively and gets labeled for being overly aggressive. But I will tell you, this is changing with every generation. And in today's world, a woman's confident approach is becoming more the norm and more respected rather than scrutinized. So believe in yourself, negotiate for, for yourself, and own your success. I think there was a great example of that recently with Taylor Swift. I think somebody mentioned at the Grammys that she made it very clear she owned her success based on a comment made in a song that somebody else was responsible for her fame. Don't let anybody do that to you. Statistics show that men reach for those opportunities in the corporate world more than women. They are more likely to raise their hand or speak up in a meeting. Girls, we need to change this. Continuously remind yourself that you are just as capable of an individual as anybody that you work shoulder to shoulder to or with. So how can you do your part to change the statistic that shows fewer women making it to the top executive positions in companies in all industries. How do we encourage and motivate ourselves and our daughters to strive for career successes that are available for them? We all start by acknowledging the issues by bringing awareness to the problem, which is exactly what John Cooper School is doing here today. And then we all commit to do our part to change this mindset of corporate America by showing up and becoming the best at whatever career we choose, push away the thoughts that our gender matters, and your ability to become the best in your chosen field. You are all living in a world that offers all of you opportunities greater than the generation before you, so be sure to use it wisely. I am hopeful this generation will change the stats that currently show top positions in companies that are held by women is in the low teens. I want to see that in the 50 percentile. Your generation can actually make that happen. I want my daughters to understand that being successful outside of the home is just as achievable as being successful inside of the home. And that either are attainable and their choice in that opportunity exists if they want it. You know, my mother 
was the best at keeping me from ever believing that I could not be successful at whatever I chose to do. She never told me I was limited in life or my career. And she always instilled in me that working hard at whatever you do will always make a difference. The competition for the sought after jobs is fierce. Guys, girls, there, there are not many of them and there's a lot of you. We all, male and female, have the resources and abilities to be successful in a career. Your extraordinary education from this Cooper School give each of you a really big head start. But the secret to your success is finding what you're good at, what motivates you, and then go do it with passion. Be part of the move movement of change in this arena. The movement's already been started for you. The glass ceiling has been has many openings and cracks that have been made for you with great many successful women. I urge all of you to continue the movement of breaking through the glass ceiling until it doesn't exist anymore. So keep up the momentum. Thank you. Next we have Mrs. Ann Campbell Geranic, a professional engineer, graduated from the University of Austin with a Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Engineering and later obtained a Master's of Business Administration degree. She is currently a quality engineer where she analyzes problems that occur while drilling wells to extract oil and gas and recommends solutions to eliminate those problems. Over her 30-year career at major oil companies, she has held engineering management and advisory positions. She's traveled to many countries to transfer knowledge and is known for her ability to mentor others. She was raised in San Antonio, Texas, along with three siblings. Her dad worked two jobs to put his children through college. Early on in life, she developed a strong work ethic and passion for problem solving and a desire to help people. Mrs. Duran volunteers in the community as a Girl Scout and STEM leader and has received outstanding leadership awards. Mrs. Duranik is married to Tom, a petroleum engineer, and is proud of both her daughters, Jennifer and Rebecca. In honor of her parents and their inspiration to their children to pursue careers in math and science, she's established a University of Texas Endowed Engineering Scholarship. We now welcome to the stage Mrs. Duranik. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and good afternoon. I'm very glad to be here today. Turn the lights back up just for a few minutes. I have an experiment I'd like to do, and I want everyone's attention, men and women. I want you to close your eyes here in a few minutes and picture uh, what the verb, the, the noun that I say, and just keep your eyes closed through the whole experiment. I'm going to ask you to picture three things. And just think about the images that come to mind. A flower. Keep your eyes closed. A bird. What do you see in your eye in your mind? Now, what do you picture when I say the word engineer? Okay, now you can open your eyes. How many of you were able to picture a flower? Everybody looks like some sort of flower. And how many of you were able to picture a bird? Very good. And how many of you pictured an engineer as a conductor of a train? Some of you maybe or as a geeky person with a calculator in their uh, pocket? Maybe, yes, there are a few people like that. Well, let me tell you, there are a wide variety of engineers. Next slide, please. They can be any race, any size, any ethnicity, and any gender. Here's a picture of engineers. And there's a wide variety. They look just like all of you. So if you have some of the skills and some of the interest to be an engineer, you can do it if you're willing to work hard to get there. And that's true for any job. And I work in the oil and gas industry. 
That's what I've done my entire career. And next slide, please. What do engineers in a broader sense do? Because I have seven nephews, and some of them are studying to be engineers. And I grew up in a family with siblings, and one of them is an engineer. Engineers build bridges. You can see the bridge up there. There was a problem. The people couldn't get across the river, so they built a bridge. Other engineers are working on cars that drive without drivers. Engineers are working on that. And down here you see a heart valve. That was designed by a biomedical engineer. And I work in the oil and gas industry, and if you have a gas stove at home, or you drive a car that runs on gasoline, and most of them do these days, our industry touches your life. And we drill for oil and gas with drilling rigs. And what do all of these engineers have in common? These engineers build things, yes, but they also solve problems. To me, the basic underlying tenet of being an engineer is being a problem solver and helping people by solving some of the problems we have in society. So over 30 years, I've solved different kinds of problems. If you go to the next slide, how many of you know where oil and gas come from? How many of you know, you've, you've learned in science, I think you have had some of this in the fifth or sixth grade. If oil and gas that we use today began as microscopic plants and animals. They were living in the ocean millions of years ago. And after thousands of years, all that energy from the tiny organisms became oil embedded in rock, usually deep underground the ocean. How do we get it out of there? We drill down through the earth and water that has accumulated above it. Then we extract it from the rocks. So we drill, you can see in the picture, at the very bottom there's this drill bit. This is a drill bit. Have you ever seen one of these? They come much bigger. This is just a small model. But this rotates at like 160 times a minute to crush the rock. And we drill wells very deep. We drill wells up to 30,000 feet. You know how many miles that is? That is about six miles deep underneath the earth. And this is spinning at about 160 RPM. And we put the drill bit on pipe, like this, very long pipe, from 10,000 to 30,000 feet. And this pipe at the surface, it looks very rigid, right? This is just a small model because the drill pipe really is much bigger. The holes can be about 12 inch, 10 inch. The drill pipe can be five and a half inch. This could be an eight and a quarter bit. Well, what happens to pipe at, at 10,000 feet? Anybody guess? What happens to pipe at 10,000 feet? What did you say? It bends, absolutely. Good, good job. At 10,000 feet, it bends. Because it's hot and there's a lot of pressure and it's also in tension because it's hanging from the rig. I can't stretch this, but it'll stretch like a jump rope. And it'll bend, it'll do like this. And it will, it's in a hole, but picture, picture my arm and this pipe in a hole. And it's vibrating. And there's actually mathematical equations for this. And it's called whirl, whirl, and it's called twirl. Yes. And this is very mathematical. Picture yourself with a jumping rope. Twirl is the W, and twirl is the round and round. We have a technical expert that can talk to you about this for one hour. <laughs> so that's what happens down here. You see the red twirling there? This is what a picture I got off the internet. It's not from my company. 
But my job right now is I look at the entire fleet that the major oil company that I have has, deep water and on land rigs, and every day I look at the drilling reports and we have rigs that break down. Because look at all that equipment. There's an offshore, there's a rig up above the water, and then there's all this equipment down hole. And it can break. Why would it break? Why would this come apart? Down hole. Yeah, it can get stuck. We're circulating through the bit, fluid to remove the cutting so that we can keep drilling deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, it can go around the bend. See, this is a horizontal directional hole. It can go around a bend and it can get stuck and it can part. We call it when it gets sliced into parties. So my job is to look at the reports. We do investigations when there's a big event, like over 100 hours, because it's very expensive if we have an offshore rig that is shut in for a week. And I look at the evidence of what happened. I'm like a detective. I've told my daughter on the way to work, today I get to do more detective work on something that broke. So it's very interesting work to me. And I, I truly do enjoy it because I look at what happened after the fact and then I try, I talk to technical experts about what happened. We have, like I said, the twirl and whirl expert. We have cementing experts, we have bid experts, we have pipe experts, and I go talk to all of them. And they, each team does their own, what we call a root cause analysis. Like if you were in a wreck, a detective would come along and figure out what happened. So that's what I do. And it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. It's like a hobby. I go in every day and I look at different problems and it's great. The people I interact with are awesome. But let me tell you how I got there. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Next slide. And how I got there. I was raised with three other siblings and my dad didn't have a degree. He was a machinist, tool maker, and then a foreman. And he served in World War II and my mother was a homemaker. So we were raised, socialized, to all be who, whatever we wanted to be. He was naturally very mechanical and he enjoyed science and uh, he had a very modest income though. But in spite of that, he exposed us to many opportunities, both he and my mother. We traveled by car to the East Coast. We went to the World's Fair in the 60s and it was a technology expo, and they had this machine that was as big as this stage, and you know what it was? It was a computer. And he talked about that computer for years, because you could type in any date, December 4th, 1940 something, the day of Pearl Harbor, and it would bring up the story. So we heard that story forever. And he would take us to science museums, we went to the Grand Canyon, the Painted Desert, the Petrified Forest, we went up to California. And so I developed this love of science. And it, he was a big influence on my life, and my mother as well, because growing up we didn't have video games, you know, we didn't have iPhones, so we played Clue and chess and you know, we had puzzles we worked on, and so my first obstacle that I had to overcome to just get through college was to work part-time and work during the summer, so that's what I did. But it came natural to me because I worked, when I was younger I worked. I worked at a pool, I had a paper route. Everyone in my family had part-time jobs growing up. It, it was just the thing to do in that time. And then I also had to make decent grades. In, I had a good foundation in grade school, in middle school, and in high school. And then I had to figure out what did I want to do with it. If I did go to college, what in the world was I going to become? Because I did not know. My oldest brother knew by the seventh grade he wanted to be an electrical engineer. I did not. But I was very competitive with my brothers and sister. 
And my second oldest brother, he wanted to be a computer scientist. He, he really, he embraced that. So I went to the University of Texas not knowing what I wanted to be. First, I was going to be an attorney. I was going to study law. And then I changed to geology. And then by about my sophomore year, I got tired of, of the, the course material. Not to say anything about geologists, but it, memorizing the chemical formulas, I, I was having a hard time with that. So I heard more about petroleum engineering. And if you go to the next slide, some of my earliest memories growing up were making forts. That's me up there in the uh, left, right hand, left hand side with my brother. Some of my earliest memories are out in the backyard and we're playing with boxes and we're making forts. That was my whole childhood. We built underground forts, we built forts in trees, we built forts inside. It was great fun. And I'm still building things or figuring out what happens when things break. And I remember uh, we loved the outdoors. The whole family likes to hunt and fish, and we still do. So we used to go out to the country on Sunday. We had a deer lease. We didn't own the land and hunt and fish. Well, my brothers and sisters and I, we'd get in streams and we would just throw all the rocks we could on them and dam them up. And we enjoyed seeing the water back up and the water rush through. And I liked mud. I have to be serious. I never mind getting dirty at all. I still don't mind getting my hands wet at all. And I also enjoyed fossils. So I found fossils out in the country, in the hill country of San Antonio, and I, I, that, that started my curiosity with fossils and rocks. So I didn't know at the time, but all of these activities relate to what I do these days and the people that I work with in extracting oil and gas from the, from the earth. And connecting all those pieces and parts of what I did as a child led me to change my major to petroleum engineering in my sophomore year. So I had to work hard over the summer to make up some lost time to graduate in four and a half years. And if you go to the next slide, I interact with uh, men, women, different people from all around the world. Most of my career I've worked internationally, so I've interacted with different uh, cultures, and I've enjoyed that. But I must say, when I first graduated from the University of Texas, and this is true with any job, you think you get out of school, you think you know everything. And then you show up on the job, and you're the new person, and you have to work with more experienced people. And this looks like one of the men that I had to work with on my first job. So it took a while to build credibility, but you have to humble yourself. Like Becky said earlier, she had to clean out the copy room. I had to do the low man on the totem pole role out in the field. And I worked in an oil field that had about 500 wells. Sometimes I got made fun of, and they played jokes on me because I was the only female engineer out there. One day I came in and I was sitting at my desk and there was a styrofoam cup turned upside down on my desk. And I sat down to go to work and I flipped it over and there was this dead mouse underneath it. And I screamed and we laughed and we had fun. So you got to have a sense of humor and you got to be able to laugh at yourself. <laughs> I have found that out my entire career. And... It's all about learning opportunities in engineering. We don't ever say that there are failures. There are learning opportunities. If at first you don't succeed, you try and you try again. Just like uh, the invention of the light bulb. I think there were about 100 light bulbs before the light bulb really worked. And there's a lot of teamwork if you're an engineer. I'm constantly working on teams to understand the problems that occurred. And studies have shown that more diversity on teams comes up with better solutions. So is there a glass ceiling as we've talked about? You can see a lady here that's breaking through the glass ceiling. I don't believe there is a glass ceiling. I've been given many, many opportunities. Just like my male counterparts that started with me, I've had to work hard 
to do the job. I've been uh, judged on my work, and my work speaks for itself. It hasn't been a barrier. What has been a barrier in my field is that not enough women study engineering to start with. In my degree back 30 years ago, there were only 10% women. Now there's about 20%, and in some engineering majors, there's about 30 to 40% perhaps. So if you only start with that few of women, then naturally as you go through the corporate ladder, there are less and less women. And you prove yourself equal by just doing the best job you can, and you're on equal par with everyone else. So next slide, please. And success for me in my job has been able to help people all around the world. I've worked on projects in over 20 countries, and some of the pictures I have up here, you'll see me in the uh, groups with some of the Iraqis that we met with in Istanbul. We helped them rebuild their oil fields after their country was dictated and destroyed by Saddam Hussein. After his overthrow, we met them in Istanbul to help them extract oil again from their oil fields. And that was very satisfying work. We got to know them. We did team building with them. We went out to dinner. We saw some Turkish folk dancers on, in the Bosphorus on a boat. I've been to Chad, and we have production there. The revenue from that helps provide services for the people. And Malaysia, and some of the pictures are from Nigeria and Australia. And that's the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. So we have time for sightseeing on the side as well. So it, it's a lot of fun getting to go on trips and helping people all around the world. I've had that advantage of traveling and seeing the world. Next slide, please. And one other thing I didn't mention about being an engineer. You're really not typecast at all as a geek with a calculator. There are very, a wide variety of roles that you can serve. You can, you can stay on the technical path and be the technical expert on twirl and whirl, or you can be a manager in other departments as I was. I know doctors that studied engineering. I know some of my colleagues in school at the University of Texas became lawyers. So if you think about a deck of cards, what card does an engineer uh, what card is the role of an engineer? Is it an ace of spades, king of hearts, queen of diamonds? No, the engineer is the wild card. The engineer is the joker. It's a playing card that can represent any card in the game. And so I hope that from our, my discussion with you today that you can connect with what your interests are, and what your skills are and help engineer your career. Thank you. Now for Ms. Rhonda Ruth. Mrs. Rhonda Ruth joined Sterling Associates as a senior consultant in 2007 and brings more than 20 years of nonprofit management and fundraising experience to the firm. She is committed to helping Sterling's clients achieve their fullest potential whether it is through growth-oriented development plans, strategic planning, or organizational development, or capital campaigns. Mrs. Ruth began her development career with the American Heart Association in Houston, where she ultimately served as the executive director. In addition to successfully expanding the Heart Association's individual, foundation, and corporate support, she was, resp she was responsible for board development, corporate relations, volunteer recruitment, and management as well as capital campaign strategy and management. She has become noted for her ability to recruit, train, and motivate her development team and gained a unique understanding of the national and local development, the national and local philanthropic marketplace. She, sub she subsequently served as an independent fundraising cons consultant to private schools in the Houston area. Mrs. Ruth holds a BA with honors in speech communication from Texas A&M University. She and her husband, Carl, have four children make their home in the woodlands. Based on her family's own experience with fighting childhood cancer, she's a strong advocate for increased research funding for children's cancer treatments and also provides personal support for other families in this crisis. Now welcome to the stage, Mrs. Ruth. Thank you for that. 
Are you guys still with me? Yes. yes. I have a daughter here at the John Cooper School. Her name is Meg. She's in the fourth grade. She has Mrs. Child. Did some of you have Mrs. Child in here? Oh, I saw lots of videos. We love Mrs. Child. It's a wonderful school. I'm glad to be here today. I was honored to be asked to be a part of this discussion. Um, before, uh, last night I was talking to one of my other kids and I said, I'm going over to the John Cooper School tomorrow and I'm going to be talking on breaking through the glass ceiling. This is my 16-year-old daughter. And she said, what's the glass ceiling? And I was like, yes! We want this generation to not be worried about the glass ceiling. Um, the other speakers have done a really good job of explaining it. And as I told my daughter, glass is clear and it can be really thick and you can't see it, but if you try to get through it, it's going to stop you. And for a long time, in earlier generations, in the 20th century, when women started hitting the workforce, there was most definitely a glass ceiling for women in the workforce. And what that boils down to is that women would work the same jobs as men, and they would do just as good a job, and they would be just as qualified, and they would have just as excellent of outcomes, and they would get paid less and they would not just get the same promotions that men did. That is changing. Um, I'm happy to say that it is changing. I grew up in a family in a really little bitty town uh, where work and education were very, very highly valued. And from the time that I can remember, my mother always worked. She was a nurse. She worked nights, weekends, holidays. She worked very hard. And I grew up in the 70s and the 80s at the very beginning of an era when women were really hitting the workforce with force. Before the 70s, it was very, very common for women to stay at home, and it still happens today, and lots of women stay at home and don't work outside of the home. But in the 70s and 80s, women were starting to hit the workforce. Although my parents no, never told me this explicitly, my parents were very intent on making sure that my sister and I grew up knowing that we were just as smart and just as capable as any boy. I never thought otherwise. It never occurred to me that a boy would have an opportunity that I would not have. It was not in my DNA. It was not how my parents raised me. In fact, I can remember my dad telling me to never be in a position to depend on a man for money, to always be able to provide for myself and for my family. And that has really, really stuck with me over the years. I went to college at Texas A&M University, and these wonderful women on the stage, we've heard, uh, we've got an educator, we've got Mrs. Bayless, who is into numbers, we've got an engineer. I am a lover of words, many, many words, okay? So there are lots of livings to be made with words, as well as there are with numbers and problem solving and education. And so I pursued, I have always pursued, a career where I can use words because I really like them. I had no idea at that time because I came from a family where I was taught that I could do anything that I put my mind to if I worked hard enough and I studied and I tried. I had no idea at that time that men had other opportunities that women didn't have. I entered A&M, Texas A&M University, in 1987, which probably seems like dinosaur time to you, but at that time, A&M had only had women on the campus for, I think, about 18 years, which is not a very long time. I wouldn't have ever known it. There were women everywhere. We were all girls. We were going to class with boys. We were studying all of the same things. It never really occurred to me in college or before college that there were limits on what girls could do. I just wasn't buying it. I was not buying it. Um, because I did not see that in my own life. It wasn't until after college that I discovered that the workplace actually could be different for women than it was for men. I made my career in fundraising, okay? Do you guys know what that is? You do? Okay. So you probably know what nonprofit organizations are. Dr. Snyder is the CEO of a nonprofit organization in the Woodlands. It's actually one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the Houston area. And nonprofit organizations provide various services to people in the community. And they don't do this to make money for themselves. They do that to help others in a lot of different kinds of ways. Okay? So the John Cooper School is a nonprofit organization. You have a mission and you have programs to provide services to educate children. So John Cooper is a nonprofit. 
All nonprofits need to raise money, okay? So we do have some numbers. I'm much more number oriented than you might think. They need to raise money in order to pay for their programs. And they do that in a variety of ways. So for example, John Cooper raises money through tuition. So your parents pay for you to come here, right? You guys know that, right? Yes, very grateful to our parents. But the tuition actually does not cover the entire cost of a John Cooper education. There is an entire department of people at this school who are dedicated to asking parents and other friends of the school to contribute money beyond tuition to fund things like the beautiful math, science, and technology building that's actually going up right across the way. So in my work, I help nonprofits like the John Cooper School use words to figure out the best way to tell their stories to people who would be interested in supporting the work that they do. It's really a lot more complicated than that, but that is basically the gist of it. And a lot of people make their living working in nonprofit organizations, probably a lot more people than you think would. And although I have no statistics to back this up, I've been in the field long enough to know that the majority of people that I've worked with in nonprofits over the years have actually been women. So we've heard about male, the, the oil and gas industry is a male-dominated industry, it's true. The nonprofit sector is, is female-dominated. Fine with me. I've liked it. So early in my career, I worked in an organization that was run by women, but it was led by men. And there is a difference, okay? So the most of us who are out doing all the hands-on work, raising the money, putting on the events, doing all the things to get the money in the door, were women. And the leaders at the top of the organization were men. Now, again, I grew up in a family where I didn't care about that because I was told, and I still believe, that if I work hard and I do my best, that I would be promoted based on my abilities. And I believed it then and I believe it now. So I rose quickly in the organization. I think because I was a pretty good fundraiser. I think because I'm pretty good with words. So you word people, keep going. Um, and during my 12 years that I worked there, I ascended to the top position in Houston in that organization. As I look back, I wonder about that glass ceiling there that I think probably was there when I was at the American Heart Association years ago, but I refused to accept it. And when I hit the point in that organization, when I had done all I could do, I moved on. And I'm very happy now to be working in a small consulting firm that is owned by a woman. We are all women in the firm, and I like it there. There is no glass ceiling there. I refuse to accept that there is a glass ceiling anymore. And girls and boys, you must refuse to accept that there is a glass ceiling. And if you hit one, then you empower yourself to move on. There are many companies and organizations out there that do not operate that way. And I encourage you to work hard, as all the other speakers have said, do your best in school, embrace what you love, and do what you love in a company that embraces your own values. So, boys and girls are capable of doing the same thing. Who believes it? Who's asleep? Y'all know your neighbors are asleep. I see them. <laughs> Boys and girls are capable of doing the same work. Embrace that. Believe it. Girls are leaders. Boys are leaders. Leadership has nothing to do with whether you're a boy or a girl. It is how you treat people. It is how you work and inspire others toward a common goal or common objectives. It has nothing to do with if you're a boy or a girl. So this is really not about girl power or boy power. This is about people power. Go out, work hard, be nice, and you won't hit that glass ceiling either. Thanks, y'all. Uh, now we will have a Q&A with our leaders. Uh, first we will go and then we will allow the The first question we have is for Ms. Bayless. Who inspired you to choose oil and gas as a career path? Well, I don't know if it was one individual or just my circumstances at the time, but I started, as you know, I mentioned in my speech with the company that manufactured eyeglasses. I was just happy to have any kind of job in the accounting field because I love doing that so much. But how I happened upon the oil and gas industry was I had moved to Dallas from Arkansas and I um, 
actually got a great job working at a women's apparel company, and it was fabulous. I got to go to market, and I got free clothes, and all the benefits that a girl wants to have. But um, that industry wasn't doing so well, and the company closed, and a recruiter actually found my position at an oil and gas company that was my dream job. And I stayed focused on oil and gas because the complexity of oil and gas accounting really is challenging. It's not the normal accounting that you'll have in your classes here. If you get a chance to take a petroleum accounting class in college, or I doubt they have it in high school, but hopefully they'll offer that soon. But it's very different accounting, but it's very satisfying. And oil and gas is a great industry to be in. It's um, energy that we're going to need for a very, very long time, so there's some job security in it for you. The next question is for Mrs. Duranek. What is a STEM leader? A STEM leader is a leader of science, technology, engineering, and math, but I've also been a STEAM leader, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Because I meant to say in my speech that also communication skills are very, very important. So I've been a Girl Scout leader, and that was really inspired by my mother, who was also a Girl Scout leader and a leader in her community. So a STEM leader helps we are, the company that I work for, we send out volunteers to communities and to middle schools, mainly underprivileged middle schools, to sponsor STEM and STEAM events to help expose people um, to um, math and science and the arts so that they will develop those skills and realize that that's something that they can do. A lot of what we, what I see over the last 20 years and in, in my studies, especially in my master's, is that sometimes women get raised thinking that they can't be good at math or numbers or problem solving or even they can't be successful in a degree with words. My oldest daughter majored in English and she's very successful. And so what we do is we try to reinforce, you follow what, what you're good at, what, you, what interests you, and tie that to your career. So a STEM leader is, is volunteering in the community with STEM events at the zoo. Um, we just did one up at the Conroe um, Auditorium, uh, Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, just a couple weeks ago. That's where I got this shirt that says, Be an Engineer. Thank you. The final question we have is for Ms. Ruth. Were you ever discounted due to your gender? Um, no. I refuse to be discounted. Um, I've encountered many people along the way, and you will too, who will discount you for a number of reasons. Um, I have never been discounted because I'm a woman. I think in part because, again, I'm in a woman-dominated industry. And um, I've escaped that somewhat. But I made my way into that woman-dominated industry because it is what I enjoy doing. But um, So the short answer is no. And don't you let anybody discount you either. Thank you. We'll now take questions from the audience. This question is for Mrs. Ruth. And it seems like you were raised in a household that really refused to accept the glass ceiling and taught you that hard work and success can bring su hard work can bring success even for a woman in a man male doll dominated field. Do you think being raised in such a household really affected your success in your field? Thank you, that's a great question. Um, yes, I do. Uh, my parents, as, as your parents are, my parents were extremely influential in shaping the way I think and uh, um, the way you think about yourself and what you think you're capable of doing 
will go a long way toward taking you where you want to go. So it goes back to the Jim Carrey example. Now, I've never written a check to myself for $10 million and put it in my pocket. But I always visualized myself as someone who was able to support myself and my family, but not just support myself and my family, but do it in a way, in a career that I loved. And I have always loved working with words, working with people, um, helping people tell stories. And so, yes, my parents always told me that I could do whatever I wanted to do if I put my mind to it and worked hard. There are always barriers in life that you will have to learn to go around. Um, you guys know this already, but it, most definitely it was a huge influence the way my parents taught me on that. This question is for Mrs. Bayless. How did you find a healthy balance between the, the home life and work life? That's a great question. Not sure I have yet, by the way, but actually it takes a lot of effort. It doesn't come easily. I think I mentioned in the speech that if you choose to have all those things, which are very possible, you do have to be very organized and you have to use the word no wisely. That's something else my dad taught me. You can't be everything to everybody, but you have to pick the priority items. And you have to make them very important, whether it's your family, your career, and it, it's all those things at once sometimes. And people will ask for lots of different things, and you got to know when to say no, because you can't do it all. But when you're in that momentum of trying to be superwoman, if you will, you don't want to say no. That's what drives you. But you really need to just think about all your priorities and all the things that you have on your plate, and take the most important things first, and let the other things take their role, second, third, fourth, and be super organized. That's my advice. Um, this question's for Ms. Rhonda Rue. Um, I noticed that you said something that you had an experience with cancer. Could you elaborate on what happened Sure, I'd be glad to, and I'll try to do it quickly. It's a rather long story. One of my children was diagnosed with cancer when she was very young, and she spent a long time in Texas Children's Hospital undergoing treatment there. She had a really big orthopedic surgery, and it really, um, at the time that she was diagnosed, I was working full-time at my job as a consultant, and um, going full speed ahead. And as Mrs. Bayless just said, when big things happen in your life, it makes you stop and prioritize. I stopped working for about a year and uh, stayed with my daughter in the hospital for more than 150 nights over um, a seven month period. And she was successfully treated at Texas Children's Hospital. And she's doing really, really well today. But it really uh, changed my perspective on a number of things, most definitely about prioritizing what's important in your life. We're sitting up here today and we're talking a whole lot about careers and the glass ceiling. The most important thing in my life is my family. And the, one of the main reasons that I work is not only to support my family and because it makes me feel really good about what I do helping people in nonprofits, but, but the most important thing at the end of the day uh, is caring for my family. And you can do that working, staying at home. There are a lot of different ways that you can take care of your family. But um, taking care of my daughter with cancer and all the aftermath that comes with that was a, a big part of shaping my life going forward. I have a very, very different perspective than I did four years ago. This question we have now is for Ms. Jeronic. Why did, or sorry, what are some of your day-to-day -day responsibilities as an engineer? My day-to-day -day responsibilities today, and really over the past 30 years, have varied quite a bit. That's one aspect that I really like about engineering. No day is, is the same. I have one uh, report that I do, and uh, it takes me all month to do that. So I interface with a lot of technical experts 
And I'm able to do this job because I had a foundation of field experience. And, and a lot of the ladies here in this panel are able to do what they do today because they started out right out of school and worked their way up. Well, it's the same thing with an engineer. I could be going to a meeting with technical experts to talk about what happened on the rig. I could be reading reports. I could be setting up a global conference call with other people on the other side of the world because their rig broke down. I could be talking to service companies to get their perspective. So it's really, uh, it's a problem solving job but it involves teamwork, communication skills, analytical skills, influencing skills without authority. So it, it's, it's, every day is a new day. My day is never repetitious. A huge thank you to our speakers today who volunteered their time to come speak to us.